When I was a student in America, I heard that slogan, which was a, a catchy slogan, at least to my ears, which says, give me liberty or give me death. Now, interestingly enough, brethren, what is true liberty? Uh, I'm going to use for this sermon the article which was published in October 1961 in the Good News. It was for those who were converted. It was for the church members. It was written by Leroy Neff and... Uh, in the introduction, he says, most do not know what real freedom is. Read here the surprising answer which some church members have yet to understand and apply. Well, perhaps some church members, or perhaps in our case, we can say perhaps all of us church members need to understand and apply. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Brethren Paul said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where with Christ has made us free. So just what is this liberty? Does this mean that Christ has made us free to do as we please? That's, of course, how the view, how the world views liberty. That's how American nation, given liberty or given that, have used the liberty. That's how all of our nations view the liberty, brethren. Now, the world interprets, of course, this to mean that, you know, we are free to follow the inclinations of our own will, in plain words, to sin. But yet, as you know, probably from John 8, verse 34, Jesus said, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Now, what did he mean? Well, the world has been, brethren, completely and totally deceived by Satan, as we are taught in Revelation 12, 9. And as a result, the world speaks of liberty and freedom, and yet the world is in slavery. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, Revised Standard Version. It says, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, for whatever overcomes a man, to that he is enslaved. So everywhere we hear of people wanting freedom. They do not want to be told what to do or when to do it. Sadly, sometimes this attitude we see even among those who are supposed to be people of God. They don't want to be restrained by law or government. Yes, we can see that in the most recent riots across the United States. Every man wants to be a law unto himself and not under the authority of law. That's spreading simply our nature. Now each man wants freedom and by seeking Satan's pseudo, pseudo freedom, he becomes actually enslaved to sin. He becomes enslaved since he disobeys the laws of his creator. By breaking the laws of our creator, we bring upon ourselves death. Now, most of mankind is a slave to wrong habits and desires. They're enslaved by passion, anger, drunkenness, drugs, or everything vile and unclean. Others are slaves to society or to the thoughts, ideas, or opinions of others. Such people are really in real miserable bondage, brethren, to such desires and passions. They think they're wise while rejecting the Creator God. As it says in Romans 1, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Instead of serving the true God, they have actually served things which they have made. And therefore God has given them up to uncleanness through their own lusts. And as a result, they have become abject slaves to their own passions and lusts. Yes, brethren, the whole world is in slavery today and in slavery of sin and there is no give me liberty of give me death it's liberty to sin yes god gave us the free will but you know instead of liberty true liberty true freedom we basically have a decaying and dying societies in this world so satan has deceived the whole world into thinking it is free yet the whole world is in slavery only free to do evil to harm the self to destroy the self and the same slavery to sin and to Satan is expressed again by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Romans 6, 16, it's, as you know, the baptism chapter. Romans 6, 16, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Well, the word in this scripture that is translated servant, brethren, is Greek word doulos or doulos, and this word means to be enslaved, enthralled, subservient. Doulos. Interestingly, we were mentioning about Greek and Greek origins. <laughs> well, here is doulos. We are all to be doulos. 
servants of righteousness. As a noun, doulos refers to a slave or person of mean condition. Now, this is the same word which is usually translated into the word servant in the New Testament. In fact, it was so translated 120 times in the New Testament. Now, with this in mind, we read the next verse, Romans 6, 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And since we're all followers of Christ, followers, followers of Christ, we might say we became slaves of Christ. You see, brethren, the way to become free from sin is to become the slave of righteousness. And this may seem to be a paradox because freedom and liberty in Christ is freedom from the penalty of sin. We are either slaves of sin or slaves to righteousness. Those who are slaves to sin are slaves to Satan the devil. Those who are slaves to righteousness are slaves to Jesus Christ. But you know, the yoke of slavery that Christ puts on us is joyous and light, as we read in, as we heard actually in the uh, opening sermon, Matthew chapter 11. Here is the yoke of Christ. Yes, it gives us joy. We're always happy and joyous as we were led into the opening, opening prayer with those words. Indeed we are. And we are to be zealous and happy about that, brethren. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which... Uh, that's, that's 20. Let me see. 29 is here. Oh, there we are. 28. Come to me, and you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light now paul also mentions in first corinthians chapter 7 he also mentions the principle of our being slaves of christ first corinthians chapter 7 and verse will be 22 and 23 first corinthians 7 22 for he who is called in the lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman, likewise he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. So in order to make this more clear, the word slave, brethren, which is a correct translation, by the way, is being used instead of the word servant. You know, for he that is called in the Lord, being a slave, is a Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called, you know, being free, is Christ's slave. And we are bought at, you know, with a price, but you be not slaves of men. That's what the Bible admonishes us. Now, since we are the slaves of Jesus Christ, we should not submit ourselves to become slaves of men. That is, we should not permit ourselves to come under bondage or slavery to others. Neither should we come under the spiritual slavery of Satan the devil. Now, the fact that we are slaves of Jesus Christ is also mentioned in several other places by the Apostle Paul. He also referred to himself as a slave of Jesus Christ several times. Now, in, in the strict sense, a master is totally responsible for his slaves. Have you ever thought of that, brethren? He is responsible to provide their lodging, their clothes, their food, and other necessities. And now we're coming to the acts of the matter, to the crux of the matter. Now this is assuming that the slaves serve well. If not, the master may have the power of life and death over his slave. Now it is because of this authority that many masters have dealt cruelly with their slaves, and many masters have had their slaves cruelly tortured or put to death when the slave was not worthy of such punishment. However, brethren, in the New Testament times, as you know, in the first century, slavery was practiced. And as slavery was practiced during New Testament times, it was necessary for the Apostle Paul to write to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, concerning this very important point. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Let as many servants, actually the word is slaves, as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. 
and they that have believed mas believing masters, those who are converted, obviously, those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, Christian slaves must have proper respect for their masters, otherwise they blaspheme God, brethren. And the same goes for our business relations in a sense because yes we can be slaves as being workers you know and we have may have masters those who are over us as the uh, those who provide uh, working places now brethren the master is supposed of course the master from god's standpoint of view is supposed to serve the slave and to take care of his needs as a result the slave partakes of the benefits of the master now god is ruling over all of us brethren god is ruler and master of all and yet he is the one who serves the most. And according to God's commands, the one that serves is the greatest. And therefore Christ is our servant, even though he is over us as our master and Lord. That is exactly opposite to the masters and rulers of this world. They exercise authority and lordship over those that are under their authority, as it says in Luke 22, verse 24 to 26. We won't go there, but I, I'm sure you remember that scripture. And therefore, when I say that we are going to rule in the world to come, as the Bible says, when I quote the Bible saying that, brethren, it doesn't mean that we'll be lording over people under our authority. It means that we will be serving the whole humankind, all the races and all the nations and all the tribes, leading them to serve true God and leading them on the way to salvation. Now, how contrary to God's just and good ways are the ways of this world. Now, what is a master? Now, in one inspired prayer recorded in the Bible, the people lifted up their voice in Acts chapter 4, verse 24. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God. They were praying for, as you remember, for the freedom in Jerusalem to be able to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, which was, you know, at that time was quite dangerous because the Jewish people were pretty much hateful toward Jesus Christ at that time. But of course, after his death and after his resurrection, many people realized that he was a true Messiah in Jerusalem. But of course, the uh, leading powers, the authorities, the Pharisees did not want this to be preached because they would then lose their lordship over the people. So what they did, they just imprisoned John and, and, and Peter. So this church, local church, was praying, Lord, and in this prayer it says, Lord, thou art God. Now in our English translations, this does not appear unusual, but in the Greek language, brethren, there is a difference. Usually the word Kyrio is used and translated into English word Lord, and so it is translated in the same way in Serbian and other languages. However, in this particular place, the word is not Lord, brethren. The word is, to your and my surprise, despotes. This Greek word refers to Jesus Christ as a despot. A dictator, as you would say today, despot, yes. That's pretty much, I think, an international word. We have it in Serbian as well. Now, actually, this same word is used several times referring to Christ. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, and in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. Now, this, this seems, you know, strange to us today, of course, because we only know of despots as those who are cruel and inhuman. And, of course, the North Korea, I think, comes to our minds. In the first place, China comes always right, right next to it. In the old, in the old Cold War, in the second last century, I think other personalities will come to our mind, like Yugoslavia's dictator Tito, like you know, the dictator of the Soviet Union, Stalin, and so on and so forth. But anyway, brethren, a despot is an absolute ruler. In other words, a despot is a ruler who has the power of life and death over his subjects. Of course, that horrifies us in our time and age. But you see, most of the despots of this world have been tyrants and oppressors. That's why it horrifies us. They have ruled with harshness and force. And however, there have been a few which have been termed benevolent. And in a sense, you might, see, you might say, uh, we might say, yeah, why not? The kingdom of God, brethren, will be a benevolent kind of dictatorship. Because we see what democracy has brought into this life. The seeds of destruction. Look at how 
the American society, the fabric of the American society is being now disintegrated. You know, democracy and freedom, yes, freedom, but if people exercise freedom responsibly, yes. But, you know, democracy always has the seed of destruction of a society. A benevolent kind of dictatorship, yeah, that's what the kingdom of God will be. And all the nations will have to obey it. Yeah, there will be no, you know, as it says, every knee will have to bow before him when he comes. Yes, brethren, God is not going to allow rebellion. Every knee. And whichever knee doesn't want to pray, you know, to, to bow down will be broken and then it will bow down. Now Jesus Christ is a benevolent despot. Why will this, well, why was he going, why is he going to subject all the nations to his rule? Because he's a benevolent despot, brethren. In other words, he is an absolute ruler, having the power of life and death over his subjects, but he rules them in love and kindness and serves them continually, providing for their needs and necessities. And since Jesus Christ is a benevolent despot, our Master and Lord, we should expect Him to supply our needs. Now many of God's people don't realize their correct relationship with their ruler and creator. That is why some of them are not as happy as they ought to be. Interesting, in the leading prayer we heard, we are as happy as always, we are, we are happy always, yes. But some of God's people are not as happy as they ought to be because they do not realize that they are totally and completely in the same status as a slave. They do not realize that their master is a benevolent despot having the power of life and death over them, but at the same time, one who has the responsibility of providing all the necessities of life. If we had a benevolent master, according to the flesh, we would surely expect him to provide these things. Now, since our master and Lord is not visible, we sometimes, brethren, do not think that he has the power or the interest to supply us our needs. Some of God's people are unhappy with their circumstances or station in life. Well, they're not satisfied with their home, their food, their clothing or position. They're not happy with their health. The trials and tribulations they have to endure sometimes discourage them. Even though, brethren, as we have read, the burden and yoke they have been given by Christ is light. Now, why is this? Well, it is because such people are dissatisfied with what their master has provided, brethren. They are, in other words, unthankful. So the question is now, did we all give our lives to Christ? Let's go back to the beginning of the Christian life and examine briefly the agreement that we have made with Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 14. When we were baptized, brethren, we agreed, according to Luke chapter 14, that we would love Christ more than even our own life. Luke 14 and verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or which king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. We agreed to bury the old self. Remember Romans 6. We agreed to be willing to give our own life completely, totally and without reservations to Jesus Christ. He was then to become our master or despot, our Lord and our ruler, brethren. And by such an agreement, we were making a solemn contract with Jesus Christ to give our lives 
to him in slavery. Yet, in spite of this, some people say that they did not know that the Christian life was going to be quite like this. Certainly, we didn't know, but apparently, they expect you know, a life of ease and plenty. The Bible, brethren, states that the life of a Christian is going to be filled with trials and tribulations. But, this, but the Psalm 34 verse 19 says, But God has promised to deliver us out of them all. And since we have agreed to give our life to God, nothing that God would require of us could be greater than this. After all, what do we value more, brethren? Our lives or the physical assets we might have? Our own lives are of more value to us than money. It is worth more to us than reputation, friends, houses, lands or cars. Since we have agreed to give our lives to God, we have no complaint, no matter what happens, brethren, because God will not require of any of us more than we have agreed to give. But the question is, did we really give our lives to Christ? In the article, in the original article, it's written in, in singular, but I'm asking all of us, not excluding any of us, including myself, of course, did we really give our lives to Christ? If we really did, then we should not be unhappy whatever our present state. We should not be unhappy about our situations in lives, in our lives. We are being continually filled with more and more joy, which is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And it's amazing as you listen to this and you remember what was the opening prayer, you think, who inspired such an opening prayer? Because, of course, James didn't know this will be all the elements of the sermon. Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit, brethren. Verse 22, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So we read joy. And our lives are supposed to be filled with more and more joy, which is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So the consequently then the question is, brethren, is Jesus Christ our Master? Because some of the people of God are just like some of the people in the world. They call Jesus Christ their Lord and Master, not realizing what these words mean and their relationship with Jesus Christ. They call Him their Lord and Master, and yet they don't do the things He says to do. And that's a warning against all of us. Luke chapter 6. I'm sure you know those words of Jesus Christ. But it's always good to reinforce them and remind, be reminded. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I'll show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard... And did nothing is like a man who built a house on the, on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. <coughs> now in this regard, brethren, Jesus Christ has told us that we are to seek the kingdom of heaven first and all these physical things are going to be added for us. As you remember, that's in Matthew 6 verse 33. Now, in Matthew 6, verse 24, please notice it says, No man can serve two masters as a slave, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, since we are serving Jesus Christ, we should not take anxious thought about the necessities of life. Because in the same chapter, Matthew 6, verse 30 says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And again, yes, in verse 33, God is our master and, and Lord, he is our supplier, and therefore he instructs us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 
I remember somebody the ambassador would set his alarm clock always in the morning at 6.33 in order to remember this scripture. <laughs> now these are brethren promises for Christ's slaves. Those who are obedient to Jesus Christ and are doing the things that he says to do are seeking first the kingdom of God and they are receiving the necessary things of life. Now since Christ provides these things, we need not to be overly concerned about them. We should not fear or worry. We must do our part. Industrious, profitable servants or stewards working diligently at whatever he has given us to do. And then he'll provide these things for us. When trials, tribulations and other difficulties come, when we may be in lack or in need, our master knows our state of affairs and will provide these necessities in his own time. But the main question of all the questions is, do we have faith? Because some who consider themselves a part of God's church do not believe that their master will provide for them. They do not have faith that Jesus Christ is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And by this lack of faith, brethren, they are not in complete subjection to their master Jesus Christ. Yet the Bible states that without faith it is impossible to please God. So the question is, do we have that kind of faith? You know, the king... Not the king, the kind that believes that God means what he says and that he will supply such needs. We have that kind of faith, brethren. The faith that believes that God, what he says, he means and that he'll supply such needs. Or are we in rebellion and disobedience to Jesus Christ and harbor doubts that he will take care of these needs? We have all agreed to give our lives to Christ, brethren. He has agreed to supply all of our needs if we seek his kingdom first. So therefore, we should have complete confidence and trust in God. We should have complete joy and happiness, realizing that God cares for us and will supply our needs. In fact, God will supply our needs even beyond what we may ask or what, beyond what we, what we may think. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Speaking of Jesus Christ as a supplier of our needs, Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So brethren, having this knowledge, we certainly can have joy exceedingly. And realize that even though we may have trials and tribulations, they all happen for our good. As he says in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, all things work out for good. To those who love God. So realize fully that our master knows our needs or our need even before we ask. We need to also realize that he will not bring upon us more than we are able to bear. I'm sure you know that scripture in 1 Corinthians, but let's be reminded chapter 10 verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So therefore we need not worry. We need not be over anxious for the affairs of this life, but can accept with joy anything that happens to us, knowing it is for our good. And knowing in full confidence that everything is going to turn out all right. We can have supreme confidence in God, brethren, knowing that He does everything for our good and will treat us as benevolent servants, providing for our needs and helping us in the time of trouble. Because James 1, 17 tells us that all perfect gifts come from God. James 1, 17. And by the way, the epistle of James is... Re Address to the, as you see, verse 1, to the 12 tribes in Diaspora. James, the bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Yes, the apostles, brethren, knew where were the 12 tribes. We today, in the apostolic church, should also know where the, where the 12 tribes are located. And we should not be ignorant of that. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, 
with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, as it says in Malachi twice. I am God, Lord God, God of Israel. I do not change. Unlike us, brethren, who have to change various molds in our minds, God works with our minds. He doesn't work with our flesh in a sense that he cares of what racial origin we are or what ethnic origin we are, whether we are pretty and beautiful or not, or less pretty. God works with our minds. Keep that in mind. We, need, we have to submit our minds to God, brethren. Our way of thinking has to change. So therefore, we need not to worry because every perfect case comes come from God. We need to have anxious free life, so to speak. Satan has deceived the world into thinking it is free while it is held by him in cruel bondage and slavery. Jesus Christ has freed us from that slavery and has given us freedom and righteousness in serving him. In return, he serves us in more and greater ways than we can serve him. And certainly, brethren, our God is good and merciful. Our master supplies all our needs. Thank God we have chosen the right master and let us have faith in that service to him. 